this part of the program I think is really important. You know, one of the things we've tried to do with the whole food conversation is to really think about all the dimensions of food, the food system, agriculture, all the different topics. And one of those that often comes up, as many of you know, is the area of GMOs. And it would be a big mistake on our part not to take that on. And so I just want to say that I'm looking forward to this conversation. And I'm very excited that our uh, Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, Dr. Carolyn Henry, was willing to do this um, and to put together a great panel that I know you're going to hear from. But let me just tell you a few things. I know most of you know Dr. Henry and Dean Henry, but just to share a couple things about her in case you haven't met her. I will first of all tell you she's a big fan of Extension. Uh, believes very strongly in the mission and definitely sees the value that we have in collaboration, in particular, obviously, in animal agriculture and working with veterinary sciences. She earned her doctorate uh, in veterinary medicine at Auburn University, another school that's a tiger, uh, and subsequently came to us in 1997 to develop the oncology program. She's a tenure professor with dual appointments in the College of Veterinary Medicine and School of Medicine. And also, again, a person that really believes in the mission of what we do in extension engagement and outreach. So with that, I will turn it over to Dean Henry. Let's give her a big warm welcome. Thank you, Marshall, for that introduction. And thank you for attending this. I, I hope this will be a thought-provoking session. Um, when we were talking about the topic of food, I said you had me at food. Um, but, you know, coming at it from a veterinarian, I obviously have a slant towards animal agriculture, um, but I also have a background in One Health, which, um, as many of you know, is, is that intersection of human, animal, and environmental health. And you can't talk about those things without, at some point, talking about things like GMOs. And I also think one of the resources we have on this campus is our journalism school. And so along with all the sciences, we can think about science communication. And so we've made a concerted effort to bring in some science communicators on faculty um, to help share those messages in a way that takes the knowledge and, and puts it out into the lay public in a way that's understandable and that's true. And part of, of this session is to really look at what are some myth-busting options that we have or that we need to, to do around the terminology of genetic modification and GMOs. And um, I've, I've assembled, I think, a, a pretty diverse uh, group here in terms of interest areas, including uh, one that will join us by Zoom. Um, and I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of their background and then letting them um, give a brief introduction, then we'll do some questions, and then more importantly, take questions from the audience. Um, so our, our first panelist is Dr. Bing Yang. Dr. Yang is a professor of, uh, in the Division of Plant Sciences, and he's also a PI at the Donald Danforth Plant Sciences Center in St. Louis. He has a PhD in plant pathology that he got from K-State, which also has a vet school. Um, and his research really looks at uh, gene editing toolkits to understand diseases and to engineer crops with improved traits. So with that brief introduction, if you could just share with us a little bit of your uh, research background and what you do here at the university. Okay. Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Colonel, for the introduction. As I said, my name is Bin Yang, and I joined MU four years ago. This is my f fifth year, actually. And my work or my research from mainly focus on two aspects. One, development and apply the genetic engineering tool, which or biotechnology could use to understand the biology of crop or agriculture and also apply those tools to engineer or f for practical purpose can engineer some improved trick or improved crop contain the improved tree. And I have been working in this area for last 15 years and I hope for we can use this platform and can answer some of the questions regarding the technology aspect and can understand or can communicate how we use this technology to improve the crop 
and how to use the technology to improve our agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our second panelist is Dr. Kate Rose. Uh, Dr. Rose joined us in August of 2021 as an assistant professor in strategic communications and science communications. She holds a PhD in mass communications with a focus in science communications from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which also has a vet school. There's a theme here. Um, and did a postdoc uh, fellowship and was a lecturer at Dartmouth before joining us here. Her research is in science and risk communication and that intersection with science, uh, media, and the public. And with that, if you can give us a little bit about your background. Yeah, absolutely. As Dr. Henry or Dean Henry already mentioned, uh, my area is science communication. So I approach it from a lot of different angles and intersections. I often look at the intersections between media, public, and science, and how information crosses those different boundaries, how there's reciprocal information that goes back and forth between the two, how scientists communicate, and how often they don't communicate well, and where members of the public form both their attitudes and how they make sense of scientific issues. Um, so I've worked with issues like GMOs, uh, looking at public attitudes to human genome editing, and other basic uh, scientific issues, including evolution. So I've been all over the place in terms of scientific issues, but mostly looking at the ways that we all make sense of the world and science's role within that. Great, thank you very much. Great. Great addition to our, our uh, group in the journalism school. Another great addition to that group is Zach Massey, uh, also new faculty in the School of Journalism in August of 2021. Um, has a PhD in communications from the University of Oklahoma, does not have a vet school, there is one in the state, uh, and has a postdoc uh, at the School of Public Health at Georgia State before joining us here on faculty. Um, with that, if you could tell, give us a little bit about your background as it relates. Sure. Thank you, Dean. Thank you to fellow panelists. Thanks to Extension for having us. Thanks for you all. Thanks to you all for uh, for coming down here. Looking forward to talking to you. So, I did my PhD at University of Oklahoma, postdoc at Georgia State. Uh, most of my research is focused on communicating scientific information about health to the public to protect public health and wellness. And uh, one effective way to do that is through labeling on consumer goods. Uh, so I've worked in tobacco, uh, a consumer good that has a lot of potential for risk to health. But there's also plenty of work to be done on issues like, say, for instance, putting labels on GMOs. <laughs> if we, if, you know, there's debate around this. And so I'm hoping we can get into that a little bit today. So again, thank you. Thank you very much. And then our fourth panelist is joining us by Zoom. There he is. Frank Mitlerner, Lerner, Mit Lerner. Did I say that correctly this time? Um, so Frank joins us as he's a professor of air and air quality specialist in cooperative extension in the Department of Animal Sciences at UC Davis, also has a vet school. Um, and he is the director of the CLEAR Center, which has a focus on research and communication as it relates to animal ag and environment. And I, I met Frank at a meeting, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, and um, it was around a discussion about um, GMO labeling, and um, we, we were talking about all the things that are labeled non-GMO that it really doesn't even make sense to say non-GMO. So, um, Frank, I brought you on, honestly, as, as a uh, fairly provocative uh, panelist, so put you on the spot there, but um, have enjoyed reading your views uh, through the years and, and what you bring to this conversation. So, with that, if you could give us a little bit of your uh, background as it relates to this particular discussion. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, uh, Dean Henry. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this. And um, well, I'm an air quality specialist, and so I'm not really uh, particularly trained in GMOs, but I'm uh, I'm acutely aware of the challenges that we uh, that we face as humanity with respect to uh, needing a, a drastically increase food supply. And while having limited resources, so I'm a little over 50. When I was a little boy, we had 3 billion people in the world. By the time I'm an old man, we'll have well over nine. So we will have tripled human population throughout our lifetimes. And that brings upon the question, how do we satisfy that drastic increase in demand 
without depleting all natural resources. Undoubtedly, GMOs have a lot to do with that. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to kick it off with just kind of the, the most basic question, um, and that is how do the terms genetic modification, genetic engineering, and gene editing, um, how do they relate to this discussion and what are those differences? And, and I think I'm going to start with you, Dr. Yang, and, and then perhaps you can fill in um, from your aspect of communication how that terminology gets conveyed to the public. Okay, we can get started. And in terms of terminology, as all you know, GMO, genetic modified organism, basically is there's two meaningful in this term. One, talk about the process and how this technology work on to, to, to get the second part, the product. So from those two aspects, from the technology parts, basically to generate GMO or some other you know, editing crop species, you, it's involved technology. Technology is, biotechnology is similar like other technology in, in general. For example, if you talk about the biotechnology, about the vaccination, vaccine, and the, the, the lots of the technology for cell phone, for iPhone. So the, 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 the technology involved for the genetic modification crop or plant or animal also is part of the technology called the biotechnology. So to make the biotechnology work, you or the consequence of the biotechnology is to do the genetic modification or make the genetic change to the to, to the makeup of the, the, the genetic information about the species, for example, the crop species. So there are multiple technology has been used to get the product of the GMO or the end product. One is the transgenic approach. So you can introduce some of the transgene from one species into the another species, for example, the bacteria gene into the crop plant and then give some benefit trait to the crop species or plant. So that's be one part of the consequence. And then another technology called the genome editing. You may not necessarily introduce some genetic information or DNA sequence into another species, but instead, make a few base pair change or just make a little bit of change itself, make to fine tone or recapture some of the superior genetic modific or genetic makeup and make the crop species superior than the, pre than, the, than the previous one. So in that case, there's no transgene involved. So that could be distinguished even though it goes through this whole process of the genetic modification but the consequence or the end product is different. Why involve the, 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 the foreign or the transgene and another involve without the transgene just of a small or, or need to be change of the genetic makeup. So that's kind of the, 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 the background or the picture of the technology and then the end product. So if you could kind of build on that and, and talk about what the scary part of that is. You know, what, when, we, when we present that to the consumer, what part of that gets misunderstood and, and where is that line between something that obviously has zero risk and then the next step that would have potential risk in, in that modification? Yeah, I, I think there are a few places where the scary part or the misunderstood part can come in. Uh, one of them is that people in our K through 12 current education, you really don't get a good understanding of what genes are, what DNA is, and how it is that these new advanced technologies, including CRISPR-Cas9, that can do these genetic modifications on a much quicker, more efficient scale. Um, one of the technologies that can now be, that people have talked about being able to do this now in your garage or in your basement, that people can just have these, mo these technologies allow you to modify them on mass scale without any sort of overview and regulation. So there's that, that part of it is that there's the technology that is expanding and developing very quickly that has scary components to it just because we don't understand what it does and we don't understand the mass scale that it's happening on and we don't really understand some of the potential implications of it. 
uh, and going back to the education system that currently doesn't really support knowing the nuances of this technology, that there's a huge gap in knowledge between experts who are working on these technologies, as well as members of the public uh, who, who may not have a good understanding of it. And that's by no failing of their part, it's more of a failing of scientists not doing a good job of communicating it, and our education, science education systems not necessarily keeping up with where we are now in terms of the technology. Um, I, I will say the other scary part potentially of it too is that people may understand that there's something happening with the basic components or the basic uh, uh, functions of food, but they don't under necessarily understand of what it is that's happening to it, but they know that there's something happening to it and something messing with it uh, that can really get to these base understandings of um, our desire to have food that is pure and natural. And if there's something happening that we don't understand, then there's something there that says, well, there might be something wrong. There's something to be concerned about. There's something to look at there. Right, and, and then building off of that, I know that, that uh, Zach, you look at, at things like consumer labels, and that's sort of what spurred my interest in this topic in the first place, is seeing non-GMO used everywhere in marketing. So. So how do we get from those labels to really understanding what the process has been to get to that point? Tough question. <laughs> well, let's just talk about consumer warning labels. I mean, warning labels are a source of information for consumers. If you think about every time you, you know, you see all the labels as you go through the grocery stores, so that's one time you're exposed to it. If you buy a bag of salad with non-GMO or GMO ingredients, you put it in your fridge, you're exposed to it every time you see it. And so it's an effective way to change attitudes among consumers in terms of, um, you know, if you just imagine for a second, like you're walking down an aisle at the grocery store and there's 10,000 protein bars <laughs> and you're trying to decide. You don't have a preference for the type of protein bar. You're trying to look for some kind of criteria to make a decision. And you see one box says, does not, com does not contain GMO materials and the other box says nothing well just the presence of the warning label or the the label that's telling you that they have not messed with your food draws attention to the box that doesn't have the label so there's really two there's something to suss out here federally regulated warnings which should use some type of technical language to inform consumers which is difficult given the level of technicality of the issue at hand with dna you know all, all these things that you know bing was mentioning and you have a second issue, which is marketers labeling to convince consumers that the food is non-GMO as a way to get them to buy versus a box with no label on it. So it's a, a, the, the, Dean, to answer your question, I'm not sure that's a great answer, but to answer your question the best I can, the marketplace is fractured. The information that consumers are seeing, present, absent, maybe mandated, maybe not, maybe marketing, might be not. The information within the label could be accurate, it could be not. So it's a difficult environment to make decisions in. Now, there's been laws passed that is supposed to uh, mandate labels from FDA or USDA. But when you're mandating a label to explain scientific information to consumers, it has to come from a credible source. It has to be easily understandable. And I'm not sure if talking about editing DNA is easily understandable. So, and then the constituent parts of the food products that would require the labeling, well, you know, depending on how the food is put together, it might, something that is labeled GMO might be just slightly different than something that's not. So the environment itself is very complicated and confusing. And, and layer social media on top of that, and we've got a whole, whole new ball game. And um, so, so Frank, as I mentioned, uh, Social media, I'm gonna throw it to you, and, I, and I'm, I apologize, I did not give your credentials when I introduced you. Um, Frank has a, a Master's of Science in Animal Science and Ag Engineering from the University of Leipzig in Germany, and has a Doctoral in Animal Science from Texas Tech University. So, Frank, the question that, that I'll throw out to you, and I know we've had a discussion about the new generation of um, consumers and their understanding of technology and how technology um, affects our, our food sources. And um, I wonder if you could speak to that question of, is, is this generation anti-tech? Or uh, mm. you know, where, where is that disconnect occurring? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I teach classes here with 400 students at UC Davis. And I can tell you the last thing they are is anti-tech. Uh, everybody is all over this. Everybody is all over other technical applications. Um, everybody is in agreement that when it comes to their health, for example, if they have a headache, they pop a pill. If they want to prevent pregnancy, they use some kind of contraception. If their father has a heart attack, then they are glad that there's such a thing as a pacemaker defibrillator. And that's the overarching majority of students that are very positive to technology when it comes to health affecting their own or their family's bodies. But the same people are quite reluctant when it comes to technology use in and around food. And I think we have to ask ourselves why that is. These people are not anti-tech, but for some reason over the last few decades, we uh, in agriculture and also advertisement and so on, have suggested that only natural food is healthy for you. Um, minimally processed food is the best and so on. And I agree that hyper and ultra processed food uh, is something that I want to limit to myself. But um, I think we probably overdid it. And um, suggesting that only animals on pasture are good for the animals, are good for you to consume, um, and so forth, I think we, we overdid it. And um, we failed to really communicate with the consumer how food is produced and uh, what safe food is. And we have definitely messed up the communication around GMOs. People still don't have a clue what it means. Many people think if you eat GMO food, then that can affect your own genes. Okay, and uh, we have to really look into the mirror as to what went wrong there because something went wrong. Um, we now have 50,000 non-GMO labeled food items in the supermarkets and 10 GMO crops. That's, that's a pretty staggering uh, number there. Thanks for sharing that. So, I, you know, I think as we look at, at the composition of the audience, we look at the composition of the panel, we recognize what the issues are. Um, you know, how does a group like this come together and say, these are the contributions I can make to kind of busting these myths and making sure that we've got fact-based decisions happening, we've got, um, you know, a concern for food supply, climate change, all of those things, and, and not even bringing in the politics of it. Let's leave that aside. Um, but how do we, and this, I'll throw this out to any of you, how do we go forward in communicating about GMOs? Where, where can we, as a collective group, help fix that? So I, I guess I can get this, this, um, this started. I do want to push back a, a teeny bit around um, this idea of, of marketing being the cause of us preferring more natural food. Uh, there have been some scholars that have really pointed towards this getting at some of our basal moral instincts and moral going back to evolutionary components of how we evolved as a species that uh, because in order to survive through forming the current human species, we had to be skeptical or a little bit cautious around the foods that we're eating. So there's this base component, an instinct within us that says to be cautious around foods that we're not certain of, be cautious around food that could potentially be contaminated. Um, so there have been some scholars that have proposed this idea that it really is based on more of this, this moral opposition or this absolute moral opposition rooted in disgust or what's often called the yuck factor. This idea that we're really cautious around our foods and what we put in our bodies. And that when you, there's just this, even this hint that there may be something that's not natural or messed with with the food without that lack of understanding of that, that often the GMO uh, pro editing process is really just speeding up what would happen in conventional agriculture anyway, but without having that connection, instead we think that there's something funny that's going on, and so we're really concerned about what those foods are. So part of the solution around this would be starting to address those concerns and not necessarily dismissing it as saying, well, they just don't know what they're talking about, and not knowing also that we can't just throw facts at them either. It's understanding really where those concerns are and addressing those right on without dismissing it as something that's um, not important or just a misunderstanding, but understanding where people are coming from. Oh, that's, you make great points. Thank you for that. Any, anybody else want to tackle that question? I think there's some room, you know, if you're trying to get policy changes, regulatory changes, there's room to do research at places here like Mizzou, but 
you know, there's opportunities where regulatory decision makers are asking for input from scientific community, but also the public, public comments on things like, how do we, how do we label these products? And so the implication being that, you know, if the government or a governmental agency is going to force someone to put a label on their product versus another product that's very similar but might not be forced to have a, a label, does that create an issue where consumers favor, due to government regulation, one product over another? And so there is space in the policy space for people, basic research at universities like this, but also people involved in agriculture, citizens can make comments, can contact policymakers. So there's room there. And, and I think we're, it's similar to regulation on vaping, which is something I, I've worked in the past, but you know, same thing here, like there's new legislation coming in. There's space for the public and for stakeholders to speak up. Well, that's a perfect segue to giving space to our public and, and stakeholders to speak up. I would love to open it up to some questions. Um, I can keep rolling with questions if we don't have any, but um, we've, we've got, I think Rob's going to help us take questions from the audience. Um, and really would love to hear your views um, and, and the questions that you have around this topic. Actually, I have a question from the, uh, the stream. It says, it seems like many consumers have lost trust in the science and educational component, so they turn to social media, et cetera. How can we combat this going forward? I yeah, I don't think that. I'm I turning to Frank that, because you have a you have a social media presence, so I I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I don't think that we can turn it back, and I don't think that we should turn it back. I think that social media actually opens uh, some really interesting channels for communication, where you, as a scientist, for example, can can reach tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people in a day. So um, I was skeptical at first getting onto social media. Now I'm very happy to be on it because. I have way more of a reach than before the use of social media. I think it's a really good, uh, a really good and important tool. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing to the previous um, um, portion there. I, I don't want to be misunderstood as dismissing concerns that consumers have. I just wanted to say that I find it interesting that people accept techniques and technologies, even high tech, when it comes to their health. They put this into their body and it's fine. But the same people who are fine with these technologies on the health side of things are skeptical of those on the food side. And to me, that is, um, a, that is an issue that I have never been able to reconcile. Why is that? So I, I can address too the, the, the trust issue as well. Um, we know that trust is extremely hard to build and very easy to lose. So part of addressing this uh, loss of trust that we have as, as communicators and as uh, people who are experts on the technology is figuring out what we can do to rebuild. So it's going to take, it's a not an easy process, it's very much a long process to rebuild trust once it's lost. And part of that is making sure that we're responsive and understanding of where people are coming from. And again, making sure we're taking concerns um, seriously. Uh, social media can be an, a helpful tool in some ways for spreading that information. It's also a tool that can really easily be used for spreading uh, additional misinformation and often disinformation. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You can reach more people, but there's really big potential there for people to get caught up in, um, an, in, in misinformation traps. Excellent. Hi, everybody. My name is Bill McKelvey with EMU Extension. Um, I'm wondering if you could address the topic of power and control within uh, GMOs and this idea that people may have concerns about a concentration of power and control in the hands of just a few companies um, and how that sort of enters into the conversation. That's a big question. Anybody want to tackle that? Well, I, 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 can, I can do, do this. Like in terms of the technology, and to technology and the process and then the end product. Think about like years back, like 90, 1990s, 1920s, and we talk about the GMO. We have the regulatory platform processing, which require lots of the data to, to 
prove to, to submit to the regulatory agency and prove the genetic or the GMO is safe. So those are custody, cost millions, millions of dollars. So that's what make the big company come forward to this to, to use this technology and then make the end product to put into the market. So that's probably the main restraint for the broad space of the technology to benefit the, 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 the consumers or they make the product. So with the genome editing technology, which is much easier, and then if the regulatory was not so stringent as the GMO previous transgen genes, so that makes the smaller company will be in the place or have niche to produce the product. And even the university can open the door, can make some so some, 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 some genetic change to some crop which contain the improvement and then those could go to in the market. So basically the constraint is the money or is, is, is the money associated with the regulatory process. And if the genome editing now become kind of less restraint required by the USDA and then you will see small, lots of small company will, will, will use this technology and technology and then they make the make the improved or edited crop species. I, I can add to that too. Um, so in a, in a study that I, that I was involved in during my PhD program that we were looking at uh, explaining um, attitudes towards GMOs within Wisconsin, so it was focused on uh, consumers within one state, but it was a state that has a really heavy agricultural presence and uses a lot of GMOs in their, in their crop system as well. Um, so we were looking at explaining what it is that causes people to uh, reject GMOs or what makes it so they feel that it's really important that their food be a GMO free. And one of those important factors was this idea that it only benefits food manufacturers, so that GMOs only really benefit food manufacturers and not everyday people. So we know that that is a big concern, that there are controlling interests from um, larger people and that we don't necessarily have public input. That's one of the positive outcomes and aspects of labeling is that it can give people more control or more perceived control over food decisions, that they are now being able to make a more informed decision about what foods they have. Uh, I think there are probably other areas of concern with labels for what it may intentionally and unintentionally do, which uh, Dr. Massey can speak to more expertly than I can, but that is one aspect of how to, how to get away from that narrative of who's controlling the food system and who's controlling the food. The other aspect of is having public input and public engagement with the issue too, that if we know that's a concern, then having more legitimate ways for people to get involved in the process of regulation and in the process of what deciding what they are comfortable with in their food systems can help. Uh, counter that as well. Thank you. Technology is a part of our lives now, and food production will continue to utilize it. How do we as educators meet the average consumer where they're at and not just throw facts at them to grow a deeper understanding of the purpose of tech in food? So we've got three educators that are, are stumped on this one. No. Um, you know, I, and I think you got, you spoke a lot to that previously when you talked about um, you know the job that we've done in just explaining the technologies in maybe not higher education but in in k through 12 certainly um, you know I, I I would say can you speak to how using a university like University of Missouri that has all these different resources how we can draw upon those to do a better job at, at that messaging Extension officers. Yes. <laughs> That's one of the advantages of being at a land grant public university is that we have this service mission as well to not just be serving our students and our communities on campus, but members of the community much broader, residents of Missouri, uh, people within our smaller communities as well, and, and beyond that as well, since we're a huge university, so we ha can have a footprint that's much farther beyond uh, Missouri. So that's that's one of the the obligations that we have, too, is to make sure that we're helping people make informed decisions and involving them in, um, in, and part of that is an education component, too, and a part of that is having this reciprocal relationship where we, we understand where their concerns are coming from and respond to it as well. Yeah, and could I, could I add to that? It's also an issue of the research done at a university like this and the audiences it speaks to. You know, academic audience is one, 
but another should be regulatory decision makers, some of it, you know, at least the work that I'm involved in. And the third audience is the public. So we, we ought to be able to go out and talk about things like warning labels or GMO uh, research or how it's done or the issues surrounding it in a way that is understandable and credible to the public, makes sense to academic peers so we can get it into journals and outlets where decision makers can then say, oh, you know, maybe there is something to the research that's being done down there. And then we ought to be able to speak to those decision makers in a clear and um, unambiguous way. And I think that can be done. I mean, one way to do it is pitch the research focus, is, you know, not to get too deep in this, but pitch the research focus to issues that have regulatory consequences. Like, for instance, doing research on whether a box of granola bars with the GMO label versus one without is more appealing to consumers. And that type of research is being done all the time on this campus and translates well to these different audiences. And, and I think we've got a unique resource in in our students. I mean, they are they are the next generation, and if you've been to D.C. lately, you realize that D.C. is run by 20-year-olds <laughs> that that learn all the important research and then distill that to to their uh, their political partners. So um, I I do think this is a great area. And then I think when we overlay that with extension, which certainly has access to um, more K through 12 than, than we do, I think that kind of completes the whole picture and I think it's, it allows us to get that whole spectrum of ages. This one is for Dean Henry. Oh no, I'm, I'm just supposed to moderate here. Could Dean Henry provide a little education or perspective on One Health and if MU is positioned to be a leader in this area? Oh, that's a setup, I'll take that one any day. Yeah, I mean, so my interest in One Health kind of came at it sideways in that I'm trained as a veterinary oncologist and my research is in translational research that translates findings in the laboratory um, through various models and eventually on to hopefully cures for both animals and people. Um, my late husband, however, was a uh, food animal veterinarian and an epidemiologist and when he passed away, um, I really wanted to make sure that a lot of his initiatives did not um, pass away with him. And he was quite concerned about food supply, um, epidemiology of diseases, how that intersects between plant, uh, animal, and, and human health. And so um, we actually had a program years ago here that had f focus areas and there was one area was, um, it was called Mizzou Advantage and there was one area that was one health, one medicine. And I was the um, uh, facilitator for that group. And what that opened my eyes to is that we have so many resources here on campus. If you've got, you know, a place that's got a vet school, a med I, I know I kept bringing up which ones have vet schools, but there was some method to my madness there. If you have that as a resource, along with a medical school, um, engineering school, nursing school, um, you know, all the arts and sciences that we have at the undergraduate level, and then tremendous resources like our J school, um, and I'll, I'll throw it out to the law school as well. I mean, I really honestly can't think of a single college um, or school on this campus that doesn't somehow intersect with One Health. And so I, to me, this, this should be a premier spot to do One Health research and messaging. And I think we're, we're getting there. Um, we are part of something called COHA, which is the CTSA One Health Alliance. And that's made up of the universities that have a Clinical and Translational Science Award that um, has a component of, on the veterinary medicine side as, as, and in turn the human medical side. So we're a select group already and if you layer on top of that that we are a public land grant institution, that we do have extension, I mean I, I think really our possibilities are limitless and that's why I'm here 25 years later um, still believing in that. But I, I think it does take these kind of conversations, it takes collaboration between the different colleges and universities and making sure that we're understanding what resources we have to draw upon so we're not always outsourcing that to other places. And I think the fact that, you know, we can put panels together like this that come from a lot of different uh, schools and colleges is, is testimony to that. 
So how do GMOs benefit consumers? I know more about what they are now, but why are they good for us? Okay, I, 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 I can't talk about the village. I'm trying to explain this. Like first, like you said, like, okay, even we talk about the G, GMO or not the edits, which has a different category of the technology and the product. And even GMO, they will have the benefits of multiple layers. One layer, you can use the GMO to produce some unconsumable product like fiber. And if you can prove this crop and you can benefit the whole society. And the second part is the feed. And the start, like you can make some product which is even safe for humans, then should be safe for animal. And this animal feed could provide the, the, the better product or even a higher product to the market. And the third one, basically, if the products which get into the food chain, and all those were benefited, but everything comes with a risk, right? And even technology you can use for good, you can use for bad, but if as a scientist, and if you can make the technology benefit to the agriculture, to the crop, and you can use better strategy, you can make the better product, which will benefit the society and also the consumer. And also same time, we have the regulatory agency, so you are not, company or people can use this technology un unlimited, but there's regulatory agency, USDA, FAS, or USDA, FAS, and the FOA, and the EPA. EPA. Now, they have this agency we could regulate it and then can minimize the risk to the environment, to the human health at the minimum time. But there's, we talk about the kind of the mistrust or some confusion with kind of the People have, may have some kind of mistrust to the government or to the regulatory process. Actually, that could be understandable, but at least the, this regulatory platform and the process in the place could minimize the risk and then can make this, the, the, the product of the edit or the GMO safe once, once make safeguard the, the, the safety or minimize the risk to get into the, into the market and benefit the consumer. I can talk about some of the specific benefits too that uh, GMOs can offer. Of course, it depends on the product that we're talking about, but within the food sector, um, there are non-browning apples. There are um, other, uh, golden rice is a prime example, one of the early ones where um, it, rice that has been modified to contain more vitamin A, so it can be more nutritious. Uh, so when there are concerns about being able to feed a growing population in the world, especially as uh, climate change starts to happen, then there's a potential for having more drought-resistant crops that are developed much more quickly and can be uh, better used in different environments as we're changing. So it's helping us to adapt our food systems to where our products are going to be grown. Um, it can increase yield, again, important for if we're going to have more limited um, croplands or areas where we can grow crops and making sure that the products that they're that they're producing are going that we're going to have more coming from a smaller uh, area of land. Um, there are also just other components of it too that can be more limited in scope, but we haven't even gotten into pesticide resistance or um, pest resistant crops, which can also help with making sure that the products that come from uh, the crops are, are ready to go to the table. Uh, it also, there's social justice issues that we can come into where there's potential benefits too, where um, being able to provide cheaper, fresh, long-lasting shelf life foods to areas where there are current food deserts. So there's a lot of different uh, sectors where it can have benefits. There are risks that come with each of these two, but there are lots of, lots of potential benefits as well. And, and you touched on climate change, and I'm gonna reach out to Frank. I know that you've, you've had a lot of discussions about that. Um, and, and what that means in terms of animal agriculture. So would you like to speak to that at all, Frank, in, in terms of how do we meet the food challenges ahead of us with the growing population um, and also taking into consideration climate change? Yeah, um, I think some of the comments that were just made are, are really important when it comes to climate, namely that GMOs can really help to drastically reduce food wastage um, both on the fields as well as uh, in supermarkets and so on. That's one issue. The other one is improved uh, efficiencies, uh, improved uh, yields, 
Uh, all of that equates to doing more with relatively less, and that has a positive impact on the carbon footprint of our food system, not just carbon footprint, the environmental footprint overall. Let's not forget, we are wasting almost 40%, 40 percent, 40% of all the food that we produce in most developed and even in many developing countries. Reducing that issue of food loss, food waste is huge and improving yields is a massive, uh, a task of massive significance. And so GMOs can definitely help by that, uh, uh, in achieving that. And, um, and I'm quite bullish, they will. Could I add, Dean? Sure, please do. So I agree with all these points, they're great points. I would bring up this, uh, this issue of consumer labeling, but the labeling doesn't talk about the risk or benefit. It just says present, not present. So it's really an unusual form of labeling because most consumer labeling, it describes the risk to you. Non-GMO just tells you, as Dr. Rose put, and I think this is a great term, like, did someone mess with your food? <laughs> That's shorthand, maybe the consumer thinks that. So all these are important issues, but the research I've seen, consumer research shows that if you're looking at a box of, you know, I keep saying granola bars, I don't know why it's on my mind today, like granola bars with the non-GMO and a granola bar just regular, folks, tend to prefer, on average, the box without the label. So GMO has a lot of benefits, but if consumers are buying the box <laughs> without the GMO label, you know, there is a, a fi maybe a financial uh, consideration here that, you know, the, the messaging is driving people away from GMOs, and that messaging might be mandated, and this is an issue where we need to do basic research and speak to our legislators and make comments to the FDA and USDA to you know, try to encourage effective labeling. That's interesting. I've never, I, I that it's never dawned on me before you said that that it it doesn't really address what the risk is. That's interesting. All right, we're down to about three minutes. So I see we got another question from the audience. So, so my name is John Fuller, and I don't know anything about agriculture, but and this may sound a little bit funny. But you kind of almost have like a Jurassic World type setting where all because you can modify something doesn't always necessarily mean that you should. And I could see where if it was more towards like crops or plants that are disappearing because some of these plants could have like a, a cancer um, solving thing to it that the world might be more accepting of it. And the other part to this is if you're yielding more crops, is it taking more nutrients out of the soil that's already stressed enough as it is. That's a very interesting point. Anybody want to speak to that? Well, with respect to the last the last portion there, um, the nutrients that crops take on are generally um, applied via fertilizer. And uh, these are not the nutrients that are naturally occurring in the soil, but generally the ones that are added to the soil. Uh, externally, and so uh, that's just uh, a quick remark. So if you have uh, higher yielding crops, then generally they are nurtured, they are uh, fertilized with external organic or inorganic uh, synthetic fertilizers. Yeah, please. My name is Ivan, I have a question. Um, if we are losing 40% uh, of our harvest of food, shouldn't we prioritize redu reducing losses of a modifying or editing could you could you hear that question frank yeah i heard the question so uh, i don't think it's one or the other i think we need to reduce food losses food waste on the one hand and at the same time we need to improve yields and efficiencies on the other it's not a one or the other it is a one and the other someone asked if uh, any of you have materials that uh, educators can give to their communities, especially one pagers, because we love them. I know you have some, correct? Not, not a one pager. But. I, I, I don't have, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a one pager. I mean, I've given talks about GMOs before, but I don't have a necessarily one pager summary. But does the extension office, they probably have stuff, I imagine. No, maybe? I think we're working on it is the answer. How's that? Yeah, that's a project. We should have that, project. yes. There, there are also um, available resources from credible places to uh, online. Um, the Genetic Literacy Project is one that's coming to mind, but there are other, there are reputable sources that do have that out there. 
And we have hired some new science communicators to help us with just these sorts of projects. So thank you for bringing that up. And I know for certain that my colleague here in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis, Alison Veninanen, has a lot of, um, of extension materials about GMOs and uh, the whole issue that we're discussing here today. I think we're at time, is that correct? So I want, I'd like to thank our panelists for discussion. Thank the audience for your attention and for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that last question just gave us a task for our two science communicators. We had lunch the other day from the journalism school, so I guess you know what you got to work on now. So uh, you heard the response. We need those materials. So uh, let's give Carolyn and this entire team another big round of applause. Great job. I hope all of us are thinking not only about the science that you're hearing about, but also the perceptions of what consumers perceive. And if we lose that, we kind of lose the game. And what we've got to do is, is figure out how to marry that so that yes, the science is there, but how do we have create that narrative that brings people toward us? And so again, I think there's an art to that. I think we've got great talent. I'm really glad you guys are at the University of Missouri. Uh, all of you. I know we've got a colleague from UC Davis, uh, one of the great land grant universities in the country as well. And we do work across disciplines. So we'll be reaching out and figuring out what they've got there that we might pull in and supplement what we're doing here as well. So again, thank you guys for being with us. Mm -hmm.